so nice that so many of you who've been so kind to us uh, will give, you, give up your time uh, to help us on this occasion. Uh, we're honored that you came here to the People's Forum, which is staffed by some of the most committed revolutionaries uh, in New York City, if not the planet. You've come here to hear about Black Agenda Report, uh, but more specifically as a tribute to Bruce Dixon, our co-founder uh, who passed away uh, this summer. Bruce Dixon and I shared a history in the Black Panther Party, but he was in Chicago with Fred Hampton and I was in New Jersey and I didn't know him back then. We met, and by we I mean the co-founders, Bruce, Margaret Kimberly and I, uh, in the process of building Bar's Forerunner. There was another uh, magazine, a weekly, uh, in, on the internet before Black Agenda Report. Uh, that journal was called The Black Commentator. The Black Commentator was created in April of 2002. Most of what I'm going to talk about this evening will focus on our time, the three co-founders, our time at the Black Commentator, because that is where what became Barr found its voice. In other words, the team spent four years finding out how to produce a weekly journal of news and commentary uh, and analysis for the black left before we actually uh, came forward with Black Agenda uh, Report. At the turn of the 20th, 21st century, in 2002, there wasn't any regular journal of the black left. No such thing on the internet, no such thing in print, no such thing anywhere in the United States. In fact, the whole field was a desert in terms of black political discourse on a regular published basis. Uh, there had been Freedom Ways uh, magazine, which lasted uh, for a very long time, uh, but by 2002, it was long gone. And then for a very brief period, there was a magazine and commercial publication called Emerge, uh, and it became uh, rather famous uh, when it published a, uh, a magazine cover uh, depicting Clarence Thomas as a lawn jockey. And that, was, that was great fun, and we wanted to follow in those footsteps. Uh, but, but Emerge quickly faded from the scene uh, as well. Uh, and, and none of that should have been surprising, that there wasn't any longevity in left-ish, black-ish uh, publications. Because for two generations already, at the turn of the 21st century, there had been no black mass movement. Periodicals of analysis and debate are components, absolutely necessary components of mass political struggle. And although political journals can't jumpstart mass movements on their own, they can tie the residue of previous mass movements, like our own of the 60s and the 70s, uh, tie those residue, the people who are still there and still struggling, uh, together with a new crop of people that have never experienced a mass movement. Uh, so even when there is no mass movement, there is a need for a publication like what Barr uh, became uh, in the interregnum uh, between mass struggles. Uh, we had a rather vague mission when we began, and I'm talking about uh, a gentleman by the name of Peter Gamble and myself, uh, when we uh, co-founded The Black Commentator. Uh, as the public publication date uh, approached, we had prepared a number of articles. We had cartoons on order, but we didn't have any cover story. We had nothing that would identify or do an analysis of the paramount issue of the day. Frankly, I didn't know what the paramount issue of the day was. There were lots of issues, but how are we going to make this debut uh, with this analysis on the paramount issue of the day? Uh, 
but the fact was that the issue was right in front of my face, and I, and I didn't even know it. Cory Booker. <laughs> And I'd known Cory Booker for about two years by that time. I had no idea he was paramount anything. <laughs> but Cory Booker was the key to this whole question about the paramount issue. <laughs> I'd become uh, familiar with Cory Booker uh, while working with a small uh, newspaper that I helped found in northern New Jersey. Uh, Cory was only about 30 years old at that time. He was just uh, completing his first term on the Newark City Council. But he had already made a national debut uh, with a power lunch at the Manhattan Institute. And if you know anything about how these things work, a power lunch at the Manhattan Institute tells the whole constellation of right-wing corporate forces that this guy is one of ours. Support him. I didn't know that at the time, uh, but Corey made that debut, in fact, uh, uh, oh, about a year before uh, the uh, black commentator uh, was launched. Uh, when Corey announced that he was going to run for mayor, the mayor uh, didn't take it very seriously because he was only a 30-year-old first-time New York City councilman. How, how could he touch him? Uh, I did know that Corey wasn't quite that simple. And when he uh, made his announcement, his formal announcement that he was running for mayor, uh, I went to it. And immediately after that uh, uh, announcement had been made, I, I went to the internet because I wanted to see uh, how the web would respond uh, to his announcement. And I was astounded. It really shocked me. I, I, I'm shocked today, uh, shocked partly at why I was shocked because I had no idea what was out there supporting this Corey person. The whole right wing universe on the web lit up after he made his announcement and they were all cheering Booker and they were calling him by his first name, Corey, Corey, Corey. And when I saw that, I knew that everything had changed in terms of the black political arena. Something big was happening that even people who thought of themselves as politically astute like myself did not realize uh, was underway. Uh, I immediately did some furious research and I discovered a lot more about Cory Booker and his right wing connections. It was widely known, everybody knew, that Cory Booker ran to uh, private schools in Newark and, and that he was a proponent of private school vouchers. <clears throat> Under George Bush, private school vouchers and the faith-based initiative, which was aimed at bribing black preachers, uh, had become the basis of the Republican Party's appeal to blacks. In fact, that was their only appeal, school vouchers and bribe your preacher. Both of those initiatives were sponsored by the Bradley Foundation uh, out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, and that was President Bush's favorite foundation. He said so. And they gave him his whole plank uh, for black people. In the 90s, the Bradley Foundation organized a spectrum, a broad spectrum of its fellow right-wing funders to create a black astroturf organization uh, that would be given the mission of pushing the right-wing agenda in blackface with a special focus on the privatization of public schools. It was called the Black Alliance for Educational Options. It was funded by millions of dollars from all of the right wing money bags. And only a year or two later, uh, when he was elected president, George Bush funded it also to the tune of millions of dollars. So it became a federal uh, project. Cory Booker was the alliance's co-chair. He was already the co-chair of this mega-funded AstroTurf 
corporate right-wing organization when he made his announcement that he was going to run for mayor. So Cory Booker was not just a first-term Newark city councilman of only 30 years of age. Uh, he was the point person for what was to become the right's biggest political offensive in black America, uh, I believe, ever. Uh, another person on the, uh, that AstroTurf organization was Congressman Floyd Flake from Queens. Congressman Flake was the only actual genuine right-winger conservative uh, on the Congressional Black Caucus. The caucus didn't have any of those people on it uh, in 2002, except uh, Floyd Flake, who had uh, retired by that uh, time. Floyd Flake went on to make millions in a school privatization uh, company, uh, all of whose uh, business was uh, engendered by uh, the Bush administration's attack on uh, public schools. He was a member of the Manhattan Institute's board. So you see this connection, this, this network that was being put together with most of us not paying any attention. Uh, there were also lots of other nominal black Democrats in the Alliance for Educational Options. And what this signaled was the start of a new political chapter because the corporations had given up on black republicanism. There had been no black person elected to Congress as a Republican since the last one uh, was turned out of office. His name was Oscar DePriest in Chicago in 1935. Since that time, no black person has been elected to co Congress as a Republican uh, in a black district. There have been black congressmen, black Republican congressmen, but they came from white districts. So black folks weren't going that way. And by the turn of the century, that was finally got, uh, that finally got to uh, the heads of the, of the Republican, at least the money bags of the Republican Party. Uh, so they decided that they were going uh, to break in to this democratic field, uh, which they had not tampered with before, not, not with black ghetto politics. That was off uh, limits. In most districts back then, uh, a black congressperson could easily coast to re-election for less than $100,000, or often far less, $50,000. These were very safe seats back then because they weren't being primaried uh, and they faced no Republican uh, opposition. Most of the money that went to black Democrats in Congress came from labor unions, and they could expect that year after year after uh, year. Black Congress people were therefore almost never primaried. In that sense, the racist and rich right-wingers worked in black Democratic politicians' favor uh, by leaving them alone. A and in fact, uh, blacks in Congress had significantly more seniority as a group than white people in Congress. Their seats uh, were safer. Uh, so they weren't prepared at all uh, for this political situation uh, to change. But it did change. All of it changed uh, at the dawn of the 21st century. Uh, corporate money allowed Cory Booker to run for mayor of the quintessential, quintessentially chocolate city, Newark, and it allowed him to vastly overspend the money that was held by the incumbent. And the incumbent was supposed to be the most powerful black politician in New Jersey. Booker wasn't the only one. Little known challengers from out of nowhere uh, came up against huge, uh, excuse me, came came with huge campaign war chests uh, to challenge Congressman Earl Hilliard in the Black Belt of Alabama and Cynthia McKinney in suburban Atlanta, Georgia in this same period in 2002. Understanding that public education has utterly failed black America, the corporate think tankers uh, found 
a strategy uh, that would work for them. They reasoned that they could drive a wedge between the teachers union and blacks. And without the teachers union and blacks, there is no democratic party. And the way to do that would be to focus on the schools. And they focused first with private vouchers and then only a couple of years later, uh, they switched to charter schools and that was far more successful. Uh, our first cover story, uh, that this is the, the black commentator in search of a cover story, that uh, was it. By the time uh, I finished checking out what Cory Booker was doing and who was backing him, uh, we knew that we had the paramount issue uh, of the time. Uh, it was titled Fruit of the Poison Tree. It explained Corey's candidacy as the tip of the spear of an historic right-wing offensive in black America. Just two weeks after that first issue appeared, our analysis was featured on the front page of the New York Times, and we got to piss all over Cory Booker's parade. <laughs> And that was, that was personally very satisfying because you, you need that kind of encouragement when you're stepping into a void, uh, 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 a twilight zone that people have not explored. Uh, we got that thanks to the New York Times. It is always like that. We badmouth these mother, but, <laughs> but when they give us some play, we consider that a big victory. Uh, and, and it did feel, it felt like one and it felt like something quite different to Cory Booker. The black Democrats, however, they didn't know what hit them when this Cory Booker campaign uh, hit the streets. It took them all by surprise, not just the mayor, all of them. Uh, Sharp James, that's the mayor's name, tried to figure out what we, the black commentator, was saying in print. He, he read uh, Fruit of the Poison Tree over and over, he told me so, and, and, and he said that he had it figured out and he understood it. Uh, now, uh, that uh, this, this guy will just hook up uh, with anybody to get elected. Uh, and, and that's why there's all these strange white men in suits uh, all over Newark. And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's something, something like that. It, it wasn't quite like that. What, what Sharp James got from our analysis of these corporate forces coming together for an historic political offensive in black America, what he got was that Cory Booker has hooked up with the Ku Klux Klan. And so he held press conferences saying that all over Newark and, and making himself look ridiculous. <laughs> Meanwhile, Cory Booker kept on climbing in the polls. He was spending three times uh, as much uh, money as the mayor. Uh, and the mayor could not understand it uh, because he couldn't understand uh, what we were saying about uh, Cory Booker serving corporate interests because uh, Mayor Sharp James, like uh, every other black mayor, was very close to, uh, very obedient to, in fact, uh, the local corporate barons. He thought he was getting along just fine with them and doing everything they say. So why would corporate America be against me? He couldn't figure uh, it out. Uh, and, he, and he stayed uh, confused like that. Uh, but it wasn't working and Cory Booker kept on climbing in the polls and uh, they started getting uh, desperate. And so in the last two weeks of the campaign, uh, all of the literature that was being handed out by uh, Sharp James's uh, reelection people and, and the uh, host of unions uh, that were also in the street uh, trying to stop Cory Booker, they were in fact handing out Xerox copies of articles in the Black Commentator. <laughs> and, and if you went to the mayor's campaign website before you even saw a picture of the mayor or a quote of anything that he said, you saw an article from the Black Commentator. Because they just decided that these guys know how to explain it. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I don't understand it. <laughs> so anyway, we, we wound up, uh, see I say we, wound up narrowly defeating Cory Booker uh, his first time around uh, by uh, about uh, three, three percent. Uh, 
And you know, I don't, I don't even know if that was a good thing or not. It was, it was good for Newark. Uh, it held him off for four years. Uh, but it also had the effect of stopping him from becoming the first Obama. So he would have been in a position to at least believe that that was uh, his, his next goal. And he had the backing of all these powerful uh, corporate uh, forces. So I'm sure uh, that Cory Booker uh, thought that that was going to be uh, his trajectory. But instead, we got the Obama that we came to know and loathe, uh, <laughs> who, who is far smarter, far more charming, uh, far more effective, which is why I called him the more effective evil uh, than Cory Booker ever could have been. So in the long run, I don't know uh, if we did uh, the nation and the world as a whole any great favor uh, by defeating Cory Booker in 2002 and, and burst or temporarily holding up uh, his dream, because that might have ensured uh, Barack Obama in 2008. Anyway, so we beat Cory Booker, but he wasn't the only one. Uh, they had two other uh, uh, offensives, uh, two other races uh, that they had initiated to see uh, if this new strategy works. One was against Earl Hilliard, as I said, in the Black Belt of Alabama, a relatively progressive uh, lawmaker and especially outspoken on foreign policy. And the other was Cynthia McKinney, whom all of you, I'm sure, uh, know and love. And in Atlanta, uh, Georgia. Uh, the, these, these were national campaigns because these, these right wing corporations, since they own the media, are very good with uh, handling uh, the media. And although the Hilliard race and the uh, McKinney race were just one of 435 uh, congressional races that occur every two years, uh, they were national news. And they were very important uh, news pieces too. The, uh, main corporate media assigned their black reporters to the story so that uh, their positions on mm, McKinney and Hilliard uh, would, would have more uh, legitimacy. At root, what they were trying to say uh, is that uh, black Americans get more conservative as they move incrementally up the, uh, up the income ladder. Uh, that as more black people uh, became middle class, whatever that is, uh, they would become more conservative. I don't know how they measure conservatism, uh, but anyway, that, that was their uh, logic. No one had ever produced any empirical evidence that that's the way that it goes. Uh, and I think that underlying uh, this theory, which is really a position, was uh, a desire to negate black politics, uh, to say that black people have no world view, uh, that it, all it means to be black uh, is to have suffered Jim Crow and deprivation and poverty, like blackness is just a bunch of have-nots, uh, but not a world, but, but not incapable of developing a world view, much less uh, an anti-corporate rule or anti-imperialist uh, world view. So they'll grow out of that if they just get into the middle class and then they attach that wish, uh, they attach to that wish a, a theory about uh, black middle class folks are uh, more conservative. And then they elaborate upon it and say that the civil rights type strident and militant talking black politician is passe. Uh, that's, that's of another age and black folks are rejecting that. And so to prove uh, this position, which, uh, which is not even worthy of being called uh, a theory, uh, they focused on these two races uh, which, uh, in which challengers, unknown, people, basically, in both of those districts, uh, had been given two and three times as much campaign money as Hilliard uh, and McKinney. But this was the showdown that would uh, prove uh, the theory promulgated by the corporate uh, media. Uh, we at the, the Black Commentator uh, spent much of our time uh, debunking that theory. Uh, the corporations 
don't feel that they have to prove these statements, these broad statements that they make, uh, because uh, they don't have to read studies, uh, because the, these rich men control the media and they can prevail simply by repetition. Uh, and so Cynthia McKinney, uh, faced with overwhelming uh, money, uh, lost uh, her bid for re-election, as did uh, Earl, Earl Hilliard. And uh, when that happened, uh, we published an article uh, that uh, was titled, uh, how did it go? Cynthia McKinney's Honorable Defeat. And then I got an email from somebody from Chicago uh, who explained that he had been involved for decades in political campaigns. And uh, he said, uh, yeah, you know, honorable defeat. Hmm. Uh, I know she was defeated. I don't know how honorable it was. And then he proceeded uh, to explain from his viewpoint uh, why Cynthia uh, McKinney uh, was, was defeated. Uh, Bruce Dixon was that person. Uh, he's the one who was emailing me from uh, Atlanta. Uh, and, and, and he explained uh, that McKinney had won just as many votes in the 2002 losing election as she had won uh, in her previous winning elections. Uh, so it, it wasn't about her losing support. It was about her not being able to mobilize additional voters uh, to stem uh, the tide uh, that had been mobilized by all that money uh, that had been thrown uh, at, their, uh, at her opponents. Uh, I, I immediately uh, arranged to call Bruce Dixon up on the phone uh, because I thought it was our job at the black commentator uh, to show with real figures that Cynthia McKinney had in fact won overwhelmingly the black election. Remember, we weren't, we're not talking about who wins or loses finally at the polls, but countering uh, that proposition uh, that black folks were turning against a so-called civil rights type strident and militant uh, politicians, obviously like Earl Hilliard and Cynthia McKinney. So the question was, is that true? Uh, did, Cynth was Cynthia, did Cynthia McKinney lose uh, the black election? That was the point. So uh, Bruce and I got on the telephone and we had a long conversation about how we can do this. And that was the beginning of a conversation that lasted 17 years until uh, this June. I I'm telling this story uh, as a way to say how uh, we met uh, Bruce Dixon because everything about uh, how all of us at Black Agenda Report met is about politics, it's about struggle, it's about how we came together to fix something or figure out something in struggle. So that's the way the story uh, needs to be uh, told. Uh, Bruce, as I said, was the veteran of countless uh, down and dirty uh, Chicago election campaigns. So he knew uh, every which way uh, to do dirt or how to defend oneself. <laughs> against dirt. Uh, one, one, we spoke almost every night trying to figure out uh, how we counter uh, this corporate offensive. And, and during one of these uh, late night sessions, uh, Bruce and I analyzed the tally, uh, the actual uh, voter tally uh, from that election. Uh, it showed that McKinney had garnered the same 45,000 votes during that election as she did in the previous uh, two, election, two elections. And it showed that McKinney decisively won every black precinct, including places like Stone Mountain, Georgia. Now Stone Mountain, Georgia these days is majority white, uh, black, excuse me, majority black. And that black population in Stone Mountain, Georgia is relatively speaking uh, quite upscale. So when you talk uh, about uh, upscale black folks in that uh, part of uh, metropolitan Atlanta, you're probably talking Stone Mountain, uh, Georgia. DeKalb County, 
which is the heart of Cynthia McKinney's district, is the second most affluent black majority county in the country, second only to Prince George's County right outside Washington, DC. So if we're talking about a model for how affluent blacks vote, then DeKalb County uh, is the perfect uh, place. If McKinney overwhelmingly won the black vote in DeKalb County against a conservative but black and democratic challenger who outspent her two or three to one, then the theory that blacks go rightward when they become middle class is busted. It's worthless and it's been proven on the ground. And it also And it also invalidates the position, and it's the twin position, that a black political consensus on social and economic justice and peace does not exist. You see, with, with, this, with this theory that black people simply vote based upon how much money they got in their pocket, you negate Black people have any, polit any politics at all. That is the world view that I was talking about. At the black commentator, uh, we felt it was our job uh, to prove and prove again what was obvious uh, to us, but needed to be proved and proved again because it was under attack, that there was a black consensus on social and economic justice and peace. And that is what had governed our politics all of these years. And we were not just a bag of have-nots that could be manipulated simply by throwing us uh, some coins. Uh, I, uh, Bruce and I uh, finally calculated, uh, and this is by giving Denise Majet, the challenger, uh, every benefit of the doubt, that Cynthia won at least 70% of the vote. But about two months after we published our article, uh, a white political scientist at the University of Georgia that the Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, considered to be their guru and expert on all things political uh, did, he said, did his own study, and he found that Denise Majet, the challenger, only got 15% of the black vote. And in his column, uh, he recommended that she get out of politics or run someplace white. <laughs> so we were right about this. But these are the kinds of struggles that you, that you have to, these are the kinds of issues that you, that you have to tackle if you are going to counter uh, this corporate narrative uh, that lies uh, at the drop of a hat, that lies before it investigates, and if it investigates and finds that what it was about to say was a lie, it figures out who lie, how to lie more skillfully. Uh, and there must be, there must be mechanisms uh, to challenge those lies, because even, even our cadres in the streets are, are bombarded by the same lies, uh, and are, are, are sometimes believe them uh, and carry on, but still believe them. While Bruce and I were wrestling uh, with the McKinney, McKinney election statistics, we got a letter from the editor. Someone sent an email to us, and it said, letter to the editor, uh, from a young woman uh, in New York City. Uh, she'd written for us uh, a brilliant letter that was critiquing Condoleezza Rice. Uh, do you remember her? George Bush's national security advisor. Uh, the letter had a title to it. it was, its title was Condoleezza Rice and the Birmingham Bombing Victims. And the writer's name was Margaret Kimberly. Yeah. And so I, I wrote her back. I was really very impressed. It was, it was beautiful writing. Uh, and I asked Margaret, if she might consider doing a column uh, for us. A and she said, she said yes, uh, yeah, I I'll do one every week. Now, uh, when she said every week, uh, that scared me. Uh, <laughs> because w we had been in operation about a year, uh, and uh, w we had asked other people uh, who wrote very uh, good letters if they might do 
uh, a column. Uh, and all of them seemed anxious to be regulars. But what we found is that even the most uh, eloquent uh, of these writers uh, usually had only one note to sing. And after they sang that note, they didn't have any more. And when they uh, couldn't come up with a new idea, a new approach, uh, a new column uh, on schedule, then they got mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, then burnout is ugly. So I was afraid, to, to, you know, for Margaret to volunteer uh, to produce uh, more than she might be able to handle. But she assured me, no, I could do every, every week. I said, OK. See, what I did not know is that uh, not only uh, did Margaret have more than one note to sing, uh, she could sing more than a whole chorus, more than a whole opera. <laughs> She had more notes than an orchestra, and she's been playing those notes for 17 years now. Now back to me and Bruce trying to deal with these Democrats, because uh, that, that was the problem. We were trying to, to figure out uh, uh, what was the best way to explain, uh, to analyze, uh, and then uh, set some other forces in motion uh, to stem what was clearly a, a, not a drift to the right among black Democrats, but a rush to the right. Now we knew it, that they were scared of money. Uh, that was quite clear when the, 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 the uh, attacks on Cynthia uh, and on Earl Hilliard had the desired effect. Uh, all of a sudden, all of these caucus members who had been in these safe seats realized that they could be primaried. Uh, they wouldn't even know where the money came from, uh, but when it landed, they were in trouble. So they all immediately started adjusting their positions. And we went from a black caucus that had only one uh, conservative right-wing uh, member. At one time, that was Floyd Flake. Then he was quickly seceded uh, uh, by that boy from Memphis. What's his name? Harold Ford. Harold Ford, yes, succeeded. But Harold Ford was by himself because uh, Flake had already lost. However, by 2005, remember, the, the offensive against McKinney and Hilliard was 2002. By 2005, there was a clear faction, a right-wing faction in the caucus. That is five or six of them that were consistently voting corporate, and there were more than that who were consistently voting for the war industries. All right, so it occurred that quickly. That's how powerful that scare uh, was. Uh, but as we were as we were wrestling with these with these questions, uh, one of the things that I did. Uh, every day or once a week uh, was go on what I call DLC patrol, Democratic Leadership Council patrol. The Democratic Leadership Council was the corporate wing of the Democratic Party uh, founded by Bill Clinton and Al Gore in the 80s. Uh, it was, uh, its purpose was to weaken the rising representation of blacks and labor in the Democratic Party. It was a uh, very right wing uh, offensive. But in 2002 and 2003, uh, the DLC was on a really big uh, recruitment drive uh, for uh, black politicians uh, to try to shed uh, its anti-black, well-deserved anti-black uh, reputation. So every week I go on the, uh, the New Democrat uh, site and, and see uh, which black politician they had uh, suborned. Uh, who had jumped onto that uh, ship. And so in uh, January, February, March, April, May, in May of 2003, this guy named Barack Obama's name <laughs> was on the list. And, and I, I remembered that Bruce said something about somebody named Barack Obama. So I said, let me call Bruce and see what this is about. Uh, so I called Bruce up, and before I can explain why I'm calling him, he's blurting out to me. He says, Barack Obama has taken his anti-war speech off of his website. I said, damn, well, Barack Obama at that time uh, was running uh, in the Democratic uh, primary for the U.S. Senate. Uh, he had 
uh, the previous October made what became his famous anti-war speech. It wasn't that anti-war, uh, but it was not pro-war. Uh, his October <laughs> 2003 speech, and he, he had put that on as an important uh, part of his campaign website. He was looking to get the anti-war vote, and he needed to get every black vote of every political stripe in order to stand any chance in this primary uh, election. Uh, so, uh, so who? finally I got uh, Bruce to explain to me uh, who this Obama guy was, uh, and he did, uh, and, and, and I asked him, well, what are we going to do about this guy? Uh, I, I see, I, I read uh, that people are talking about him, that he's a, a rising star. I, I see he's a, he's a handsome person. Uh, he looks like the kind of package that uh, they like in, in uh, retail politics. Uh, he said, well, well why, don't, why don't we just talk to him? I said, yeah, let's, let's talk to him. How do we do that? So oh, I got his number. <laughs> it turned out that Bruce Dixon uh, had worked under Barack Obama when uh, Obama was head of a massive voter registration drive in 1992 in Chicago uh, that registered a couple of hundred thousand new voters and that registration drive is credited with electing Carolyn Mosley Brown, uh, the first black woman uh, senator. And Bruce was one of his lieutenants. Uh, and so Bruce went to uh, Barack and uh, Michelle's wedding and, and had his home number right there in his pocket. So uh, Bruce called him up and uh, said, you know, we need to talk to you about your membership in the DLC. Uh, Obama denied that he was in the DLC. Uh, we knew that was a lie because the, we got it from the DLC uh, news, newsletter. And we understood that when you're featured in that newsletter, that really has the same purpose as the Manhattan Institute inviting you to be the star of their power luncheon. It tells everybody, this is our guy, he's all right, give him some money. He's been vetted. DLC was a vetting instrument, and uh, uh, Obama uh, had submitted to that to that vetting. Uh, so we argued with him on the phone, it was like a three-way, uh, and, and got tired of that, and, and he, he said that he, and we, were, we had already written an article questioning whether he was in the DLC by this time. And so Obama said, well, let me write something. And so he answered Bruce Dixon's article uh, questioning uh, Obama about his uh, uh, apparent membership in the DLC, uh, denying that he was a member. You can see that article. It really is of historical importance. If you go to the Black Commentator, look at the whole month of June, and you will see the back and forth between Obama and us. We got tired uh, after he uh, did his uh, reply, uh, we still uh, couldn't get uh, a truthful answer out of him. And so finally I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm tired of this. Let's give him a bright line test. Uh, and uh, there'll be three questions. And if, if he answers all three of them correctly to our satisfaction, then he should not be in the DLC, even if he is. And if he asks, answers them incorrectly, then he ought to be in the DLC. And so we sent him uh, the three questions. And you know, I forgot one of those questions, but two of them were, uh, if I am elected to the United States Senate, I will immediately submit a bill uh, to withdraw from Iraq. And the same language uh, to uh, establish single payer healthcare. And there was another uh, issue uh, too that he would lie uh, about. He sent us a reply, and you can see that in one of these June uh, two, 2003 issues, uh, in which he fudged every single answer. And anybody would have flunked him uh, as, as having uh, not satisfactorily uh, responded to the question. And that put Bruce and me in a quandary, because we knew that this guy was up and coming, and he was such an attractive 
uh, package. And although Bruce had known him earlier, I had gotten to talk to him, and I said, this guy's charming, too. He was scarily charming, you know. <laughs> and, and, and what we were afraid of, since the black commentator was only a year old, and, and we were trying to figure uh, how we walk <laughs> this thing, uh, we were afraid that we would be criticized uh, as crabs in a barrel. Uh, that's uh, always trying, every time a brother moves up, they then crabs in a barrel trying to drag him back down. <laughs> and so, frankly, we punked out. And we, should, we should have flunked him, but we passed him and let it go and hoped that maybe he'd get run over by a car <laughs> or something. <laughs> but that we weren't going to hurt ourselves by, by criticizing him. <laughs> anyway. About that, as, as the, ne the next two, two years and three years wore on, uh, we decided, and I'm not going to elaborate on it, and I never have, uh, that the black commentator wasn't the vehicle uh, for us, so Margaret, and Bruce and I decided uh, that we would uh, launch uh, another uh, magazine, uh, but we didn't have any money. So I went to Bill Lucy of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, who had been a, a comrade of mine for, uh, since the 70s, uh, and told him our problem. Uh, and, and Bill Lucy uh, gave us $10,000, uh, which, uh, which was in the form of, a, of of a, a purchase of advertising, which they of course didn't need, but that's how we did the trans, transaction. And that was enough uh, for us to, some months later, uh, in October of 2007, uh, launch Black uh, Agenda Report. But we, we didn't know how to build a website. So in that interim, Bruce Dixon learned the rudiments of site building. <laughs> so that when the time came, uh, we were ready. The site was kind of rickety, uh, but it was good to look at, and it got us started. We published that first issue, as I said, in October of 2006. Uh, it seemed that we had only just gotten started, however, uh, when the black political environment absolutely collapsed. It collapsed in, o in an Obama maniacal delirium. And, and when I say collapsed, I mean that the revolutionaries that we thought we knew, uh, our comrades that we had been in so many uh, struggles uh, and movement activities with uh, over decades and decades, uh, people who said that they were, <laughs> they were revolutionaries to the death, we, we found uh, with Barack Obama's uh, rise and, and subsequent nomination that all these brothers and sisters really wanted was a black president. That was, that was it. Uh, and they never imagined that they might get one, and so they talked this revolutionary stuff. Uh, but the brass ring uh, seduced them immediately. And that began what uh, we called the lonely time. Uh, and in, in that period, we, our mission, although it remained uh, the same, uh, to confront uh, the rule of the rich, the rule of the racist rich, the rule of capital. Although our mission remained the same, uh, we often felt that all we were accomplishing, uh, these were on bad days, that all that we were accomplishing uh, is letting f scattered folks who had not lost their minds behind Obama know that they were not crazy, <laughs> yeah, that they were sane. You know, this, this was the weekly reminder of their sanity. During this Black Agenda report period, we of course met the people uh, who filled out the voice that we had tried to develop at the Black Commentator. Uh, it gave us range and gave us depth and made us funnier and more likable people than we were, and that of course, it includes uh, Tony Montero, Dr. Tony Montero from <laughs> Philadelphia, 
who, who does not contribute many articles to us, but they're all so heavy that it takes us weeks to digest them. So I think he's being merciful to us by only dribbing and drabbing us articles. And of course, we met uh, Raymond Nat Turner and uh, Nellie Bailey. Nellie Bailey, who introduced me to many of you, and I'm eternally grateful uh, for being uh, a guide uh, to uh, left politics in New York City. Uh, we met Marsha Coleman Adebayo, who's there. She's the veteran activist, and she's a scientist, and uh, she's a famed whistleblower. Uh, <laughs> and Ajamu Baraka, uh, who is a soulmate of all of us and also a, an editor and a columnist of Black Agenda Report, which he was before he ran for vice president on the Green uh, Party's ticket. Uh, and then later, uh, we were so fortunate in meeting Danny Haifong, our contributing editor. And Danny Haifong, in turn, uh, met Roberto Servant. And Roberto Servant is now the book forum editor of Black Agenda Report. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little later on. But the team of Danny Haifong and Roberto Servent then created this magnificent book on American exceptionalism, which, which examines that subject back and forth, up and down in all of its aspects. I think it's one of the most important political works of the last several years uh, because it tackles something uh, that is not so easily grasped. You can't put American exceptionalism in numbers. You can't run the metrics uh, on it. It has to do with political culture. It has to do with the past invading the present. Uh, these, these are difficult subjects, and yet Danny and Roberto uh, explored them relentlessly and, and effectively, and, and I'm so glad uh, that we can, can get some of the glory out of that book. And Margaret's going to give us some more in January. <laughs> and finally, and I think I've used up all my time, haven't I, Nelly? Yes, I have. <laughs> finally, I want to talk about the Bar Book Forum. And there's a, a little, very brief story on that. Uh, I had always wanted uh, to establish a, a website, a publication, that would do for the black left intelligentsia, not that I knew too many of these people, but I imagine they were out there, <laughs> which would do for the black left intelligentsia what publications like the old New York Review of Books or the London Review of Books did for leftish white intelligentsia, that they have this kind of forum for uh, argumentation. Um, but th that was just, uh, that was just a, a, a dream uh, that I couldn't, was, I'm not equipped uh, to put in motion because I'm not from academia and I don't know the world of books. And uh, Bruce Dixon, although more educated than me, uh, also didn't understand that world. And Margaret, who is superbly uh, educated, uh, she doesn't know about that world either. And, and so we were not equipped uh, to put this in motion and I was about to let uh, the domain site uh, die or relapse. Uh, and then Danny met Roberto. And Roberto said, I'll do that. <laughs> and within months, he was doing that. And we have been blessed uh, to have uh, this ongoing, every week, uh, focus on books by left and mostly black uh, intellectuals, not all of them academics, many of them activists at well, as well. Uh, so that we can provide a forum for their works so that people know about them, uh, but more than that, a place for a conversation about the vital subjects that they raise. Uh, so I guess on our 13th birthday, we are almost grown. <laughs> we're getting there. I, I think we're adolescent, uh, but that means there is a promise of much better to come. Thank you so much.